get um, uh, a strategy on how we're going to be moving forward um, in the next couple of days. So Senator Risch. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. And uh, this we do. This happens around here occasionally. We get uh, uh, things get into a bottleneck, and that's where we are. So thank you very much for accommodating me. Uh, let me begin uh, uh, with the position of Assistant Secretary of State uh, for uh, Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. This is a critically important post. Uh, DR, the DRL Bureau manages millions of dollars in assistance around the world. This assistance and this platform must be used to further U.S. national interests uh, and not the uh, agenda of the left, and particularly as to social issues. In particular, I'm concerned by recent efforts to expand the definitions of human rights and human rights defender. It is critical we continue to support internationally recognized human rights around the world and not get distracted by niche causes. If everything else is defined as a right, we lose focus and, su and success will escape us. Ms. Rand, should you be confirmed, by ex I expect you will help ensure U.S. taxpayer dollars are directed to those most vulnerable and to the most trusted partners who value working with the American people. On the nomination of the ambassador uh, for Timor-Leste, it is important that we further develop our partnership there alongside uh, allies like Australia. In particular, we should focus on infrastructure development and energy security, including liquid natural gas, given the country's resources. China has made big inroads on infrastructure development. Uh, we must counteract that. Finally, on the nomination of U.S. Uh, Coordinator for International Communications and Information Policy, Mr. Lang, this uh, has years of experience working on cyberspace at the State Department. Unfortunately, the Department has been behind on these issues. I look forward to hearing about how the Bureau of, of Cyberspace and Digital Policy can advance U.S. Uh, leadership on digital issues and limit reliance on Chinese-made equipment in 5G networks worldwide. With that, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. And, and before S Senator Risch leaves, let me thank him for his cooperation in arranging for this hearing. Uh, we recognize that our schedules have been very, very challenging over the, this year, and our effort is to try to move as many of the President Biden's nominees as possible, and I thank Senator Risch for his cooperation in allowing us to schedule this hearing. We added two additional nominees and, uh, with, the, uh, with Senator Risch's cooperation, so thank you very much thank in you, that Mr. regard. And let me just assure our nominees first, thank you for your willingness to serve. It's a challenge. Uh, public service is not easy, and you have, uh, in many cases, devoted your entire careers to, to public service. So we thank you very much for your willingness, and we thank your families. I think we see some of your families in the front row. Uh, if not, we have some very young people who are here. But we, uh, we thank you and your families, because we know it's a family uh, sacrifice to, to serve in the, in, in the public domain. And, and let me also just point out the obvious. This hearing is very important. And we'll be asking you some questions at this hearing. There'll be some questions for the record that we'll ask you to, to um, uh, respond to. Our staffs have already done a lot of vetting in regards to your nomination. So it's a whole process. And just want to explain that for particularly the young people that are here. There's a whole process that we go through in regards to uh, vetting nominees and to the Senate confirmation of nominees. So uh, this is one part of it. The hearing is a very important part of it. Uh, but I want to just acknowledge why there may not be as many senators here today as we normally have. That speaks to two things. First, it speaks to the quality of the people who are nominated. They are outstanding, and the, the, we recognize that, and to the conflicts on our schedule today as a result of the supplemental uh, appropriation bills that are being considered uh, as this hearing is taking place. We do have a scheduled vote for a little later this afternoon. And there's negotiations going on as to how that vote will take place, et cetera. So that's the reasons why you might not see the type of normal uh, participation at this hearing. It's a reflection, I think, of the quality, uh, the positive quality of our nominees, as well as the conflicts uh, that are on the schedule today. But we wanted to be able to move these nominees forward. So again, thank you for your cooperation. I'm going to start with the Department of uh, uh, Department's Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor (DRL). Whether your generals from Miramar or the Kremlin in Moscow, repression is on the rise. Attacks against human rights defenders are up across the globe. 
Coups and democratic backsliding threatens progress on every continent in Africa. Instability now stretches from the Red Sea to the Atlantic. Behind all of this is the cancer of corruption that undermines the rule of law, good governance, threatening democratic institutions and human rights. That is why we need an assistant secretary who will be there, a powerful voice for democratic values and human rights. The DRL Bureau has not had a Senate confirmed leader for more than three years. That's unacceptable. We need to have a confirmed person at DRL. Why? Because it's our voice in regards to our values. And the, there's a lot of uh, areas that the State Department needs to concentrate on as it deals with diplomacy globally. We recognize that. Our missions have a lot of important tasks that they have to take, take, take on. But we need someone to advocate for our values at the highest levels of the department. And that requires us to have a confirmed person in that position. Dr. Rand, if confirmed, I hope you will commit to be a strong voice to protect and advance American values. That means being a champion on DRL's global democracy programs. That means raising staff morale and strengthening the reach of the Bureau and policy discussions in the department and across the interagency deliberations. That means harnessing the global Magnitsky Human Rights Accountability Act to advance human rights agenda. I wrote the Magnitsky Act to honor a young lawyer in Russia who discovered corruption. He reported it to the authorities, so they arrested him, they tortured him, and he died in a Russian prison. I hope you will commit to strengthening the use of global Magnitsky provisions if you are confirmed. More recently, in December, a new law was enacted as part of the State Department's Authorization Act. It mandates that the administration submit to Congress reports on how the governments of the world are fulfilling their obligations to battle against corruption in all forms, the Combating Global Corruption Act. To ensure this is done well, I expect DRL will have to play a very, very important role because it's not going to be embraced by every mission around that we have around the world. It's going to be your responsibility, if confirmed, to make sure that that law is implemented as Congress has intended it to be. Now let me turn to Ms. Welton and Timor Tag earned uh, its independence after centuries of colonial rule under Dutch and then Indonesian governments. Even today, we see senior figures rising to power in Indonesia that threatens to drag up nations' painful past. So whether it's being a partner to their energy transition or supporting our Peace Corps volunteers on the ground, the United States has obligations to support the youngest country in Asia's democratic ambitions. Finally, I want to welcome Mr. Lang, who is the nominee to lead the Coordination for International Communications and Information Policy at the State Department. Not many people truly understand the intricacies of this position, but it's incredibly important. That is because part of your job will be to continue to build and strengthen our cybersecurity policies, in an area where the world's autocratic regimes have shown increasing interest. So I hope you will commit to making human rights and the protection of the democratic institutions one of your priorities. I look forward to hearing from all of you about that. And without objection, I'm going to ask consent to include in the record a statement from Senator Klobuchar in support of Mr. Lang. She had hoped to be here, but she's engaged in some other activities, but she wanted me to make sure that I express her strong support for your nomination and include her comments in our record. With that, we're going to now turn to our witnesses. First, uh, uh, Dr. Rand, who currently serves as a Distinguished Resident Fellow in Strategic Affairs at Georgetown University's Institute for Study of Diplomacy, and as a lecturer at Princeton School of Public and International Affairs. Dr. Rand has spent the past two decades in public service, including most recently as the Director of the Office of Foreign Assistance at the Department of State. Dr. Rand, you'll be followed by Ms. Welton, who serves as the Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary for Programs and Operations in the Bureau of Political and Military Affairs. She previously served as the lead negotiator for bilateral defense agreements that involve access 
st uh, status protection and burden sharing with more than 25 years of experience in foreign service, including in Cabal and Helsinki. And I understand you're fluent uh, in, uh, uh, in several languages, including Korean, Indonesia, Indonesian, German, and Sundari, and Finnish. So uh, you far exceed my capacity as I struggle to be able to speak in English. So thank you very much for your, your capacities that are desperately needed at the State Department. And then Mr. Lang has been the Deputy Assistant Secretary for International Information and Communication Policy since November 2022. Previously served as the Minister Counselor for Economic Affairs at the U.S. Embassy Tokyo and the Bureau of Economic and Business Affairs Office of the International Communications and Information Policy as, as Director of both the Office of Multi- Lateral Affairs and the Office of Bilateral and Regional Affairs. He served in Mexico City. He's been a senior analyst to the U.S. Trade Representative in the Office of Japan, uh, Korea, and APAC Affairs. So he served in China and t Taipei, which is an interesting combination that you have, uh, which I think will serve us well in those capacities. So let's start first with Dr. Rand. Your full statements will be made part of our record. Uh, we ask that you try to summarize your comments in about five minutes. Sure, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thanks also to uh, Senator Risch for his words um, in the very beginning. Members of the committee, thanks for considering my nomination today for the position of Assistant Secretary for DRL. And I wanna first and foremost thank my family for their love and support. You see behind me, Doug Rand, my tremendous husband, and my children, Maya, Jonah, and Elijah Rand. And I also wanna thank my parents who are not here but are watching from Boston, Esther and Richard. 20 years ago, as a Senate staffer in this very building, I was inspired to pursue a career in U.S. foreign policy in order to advance U.S. interests and values. In the ensuing decades, whether serving within the U.S. government or in nonprofits, I have strived to advance American power, especially our unique ability to improve lives at home and abroad. I am committed to transformative ethical leadership, leaving the institutions where I serve better than when I found them, focusing on mission, impact, and integrity. If confirmed as the Assistant Secretary for DRL, I plan to pursue a number of priorities, but for the sake of time, let me focus on three of particular significance. First, how we respond to the PRC is of fundamental, urgent importance to those of us who care about the norms shaping the world that we leave for our children. Yes, the US is not only competing with the PRC in the military and economic domains, these are critical to U.S. national security and prosperity. But this is also a contest about the fate of the rules-based international order. The PRC's vision suppresses freedom of expression and persecutes ethnic and religious minorities. Second, in the wake of Russia's unprovoked aggression against Ukraine, mitigating the threat that Russia poses to European and global security must remain a top priority for the United States and those who care about democratic values. Russia promotes its venal mode of governance, delights in mobilizing the world's authoritarian, authoritarians who are threatened by democratic freedoms. And third, if confirmed, I will prioritize working with this committee and all of Congress on the critical body of international human rights laws that you all have worked on for decades. In particular, Mr. Senator, Senator, Mr. Chair, Senator Cardin, I wanna just emphasize how much I want to work with you and your staff on implementing the countering corruption bill that you just mentioned that has just passed and congratulate you on the, on the years of work. In my view, the Assistant Secretary of State for DRL has a special responsibility to work with Congress on its many human rights related efforts. There are many other regions where I'm concerned about democratic backsliding, closing civic space, unjust labor standards, and religious freedom. I note in particular the democratic backsliding in Africa and continued repression in Iran. If confirmed, I will dedicate myself to promoting the rule of law and advancing human rights and fundamental freedoms. Without the United States having afforded these rights to generations of my own family, I would not have this professional opportunity to take on this responsibility today. I look forward very much to our conversation and to your questions. Thank you. I, I know the clock says two minutes, but if you want to take more time, that's perfectly okay. Ms. Walton? Turn that on. Chairman Cardin, um, thanks to Ranking Member Rish in absentia and distinguished members of the committee. It is an honor to be here today as President Biden's nominee to serve as the U.S. Ambassador to Timor-Leste. 
I'm deeply grateful to the President and Secretary Blinken for placing their confidence in me to represent the United States in Dili. If confirmed, I look forward to working closely with the committee to advance U.S. interests in Timor-Leste. I'm only here today because of the support of friends and family, especially my three children who are at work today, um, who have kept me grounded and made me laugh and always proud. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank my colleagues who began this journey with me in 1984 with the United States Information Agency, one of whom, Carlos Aranaga, is here today. We were charged with telling America's story to the world. We did, and we still do. That mission has never been more important than it is today. I grew up in a small town in upstate New York. I was the first person in my family to have a passport, getting on a plane when I was 16 to spend a year in Japan as an exchange student. That experience gave me the courage and the language skills <laughs> to pursue public service as a diplomat and an appreciation for powerful change that can come through international education. I'm pleased to report that the United States and Timor-Leste enjoy strong bilateral relations. Timor-Leste is a democracy that shares our commitment to upholding human rights and fundamental freedoms. It is also a developing country with still nascent institutions, limited human capital, and significant economic and health challenges. Through engagement that strengthens Timor-Leste's governance institutions, security, and economic stability, the United States has become one of Timor-Leste's most essential partners. If confirmed as ambassador to Timor-Leste, I will focus on deepening our partnership as we work together toward a free and open Indo-Pacific region. Further, if confirmed, my highest priority will be the safety and security of all U.S. citizens in Timor-Leste, including our amazing Peace Corps volunteers. I will also prioritize the well-being of our mission personnel and their families and ensure a productive, safe, and respectful workplace. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear here today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Mr. Lang? Thank you, Chairman Cardin and members of the committee, and I'd also like to express my appreciation to Ranking Member Risch for his comments earlier. Uh, I'm deeply honored to be before you today as the President's nominee to serve as the U.S. Coordinator for International Communications and Information Policy. I'm happy to have my wife, Karen Lang, my mother, Stephanie Lang, and my daughter, Natalie, here with me today. Uh, my other daughter, Veronica, is watching, watching from Michigan. Without their support, I wouldn't be here. The digital economy has become the foundation of the global economy, improving lives around the world. But with these great benefits have also come challenges, and we must work diligently and relentlessly to overcome them. I'm proud to be part of the U.S. team in the Bureau of Cyberspace and Digital Policy, championing an affirmative vision for technology and supporting America's unmatched leadership in innovation and entrepreneurship. We urgently need solidarity with like-minded partners around the world to better face the existential challenge from countries that don't share our democratic values, particularly China. The PRC's stated ambitions for leadership in the digital economy are clear. We must work together with those who share our rights-respecting approach to ensure that we lead the development and deployment of advanced technologies. We and our partners must lead in setting standards, defending norms, and building interoperable regulatory frameworks, not only because it is critical to our national security and economic prosperity, but also to make sure that technology enables free expression and other basic rights. We cannot allow these technologies to become tools to monitor citizens, censor dissent, and measure loyalty. If confirmed, I will accelerate our work to promote trusted supply in digital infrastructure in markets around the world. We will encourage telecom operators to choose trusted vendors when building out 5G networks, and we'll further expand that work to include other technologies, like cloud services, data centers, subsea cables, and satellite networks. The Senate Foreign Relations Committee has been a strong supporter of the Bureau of Cyberspace and Digital Policy. Confirming a U.S. coordinator for international communications and information policy with the rank of ambassador will further elevate this important work. And if confirmed, I commit to consulting with you as we advance our leadership in this increasingly critical domain of global competition. Thank you so much for the opportunity to appear before you here today. I look forward to any questions you have. Again, thank you all for your, for your testimonies. And, uh, 
I have obligatory questions that we asked all uh, of our nominees to the executive branch. I would ask that you would answer them individually, yes or no. Uh, and it deals with cooperation with our committee. So the first question is, do you agree to appear before this committee and make officials from your office available to the committee and designated staff when invited? If you just go down the line, be fine. Yes. Yes, I do. Yes. If confirmed, do you commit to keep this committee fully and currently informed about the activities under your purview? Yes, I do. Yes, absolutely. Confirmed, do you commit to engaging in meaningful consultations while policies are being deployed, not just providing notification after the fact? I will, yes. Absolutely, yes. Yes. If confirmed, do you commit to properly responding to requests for briefings and information requested by the committee and its designated staff? Yes, I do. Yes. Yes, I will. Well, you all passed those tests. That was you did a good job. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, Dr. Ann, I want to start uh, in regards to DRL and the challenges that you will have, if confirmed, in implementing policies that sometimes present challenges to different missions or different other agencies within the Department of State. So we have passed several bills dealing with PRC and accountability. We passed the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act, the Uyghur's Forced Labor Protection Act, the Hong Kong Aut Autonomy Act. If confirmed, how can you help us make sure that those laws are implemented, not just by the United States, that we work on a multilateral uh, dimension in order to carry out the intent of those bills passed by Congress? Thanks, Senator Cardin. I just want to step back for a second and note the, the worrisome trends in, with the PRC and it's uh, in Hong Kong in particular in the past couple months. Um, and I would just note that Freedom on the Net report noted for the sort of ninth year in, in um, consecutively that the PRC is jailing the most journalists in the world, shocking number, uh, and half of those are actually Uyghur journalists. So that was just a, a statistic that underscores the importance of this body of legislation that you all have worked on. Um, and I also want to note my concern for the record of what's going on in Hong Kong, especially this, uh, the jailing of Jimmy Lai, of course, but also the announcements of these bounties for individuals who are outside um, of the country. In terms of our collaboration together, I see that as fundamental to my role as Assistant Secretary in DRL. These laws come from great ideas that were hatched here in this body that I respect, where I've worked. Um, and more can be done in the State Department, frankly, to implement them. Um, I understand that there's been some discussion about how we can work together uh, to increase the implementation of some of the, and the, and the Uyghur Policy Act, uh, UFPLA in particular, and I have some ideas that, if confirmed, I'd like to come back here and share with you all about what we can do. You noted on the multilateral aspect of our human rights policy, and this is critical. This is where U.S. leadership at the UN Human Rights Council and other international organizations, but also bilaterally with key like-minded partners in Europe, uh, in Australia, Canada, elsewhere, can help force multiply our efforts, especially when it comes to the PRC. So if confirmed, I will work with critical allies to make sure that some of our measures of accountability on the PRC are duplicated around the world because it's the pinch multilaterally that will really be felt there. Thank you. I, I thank you for that. And I appreciate you mentioning the Global Fighting Global Corruption Act in your opening comments. I will not ask further questions on that, but it's going to take tremendous effort on your part to get that implemented the way Congress has intended. Uh, and I think in regards to global Magnitsky, uh, there is a well understood uh, within the executive branch of the importance of that program and the fact that it can be even of greater use and you will have a, a key role to play in that regard. I, I want to cover the issue of, uh, of uh, Russia and in Gaza, the lack of having an international community voice in those countries through their civil societies. In Russia, we see activists imprisoned every day who try to engage their country uh, to promote democracy. And we know civil societies are struggling within Russia to be, have any role whatsoever. I would state that if we're going to have peace in Gaza, 
we need to have civil societies that are active, that can help the people with their own authorities, as well as speaking out in regards to the needs. So what can you see you do in order to strengthen the presence of civil societies in those areas where civil societies are struggling? Thanks, Senator. So in Russia right now, it seems as if the revisionism and the aggression that was so clearly on display in February of 2022 when uh, Russia invaded Ukraine has uh, ex been expressed also through an increased repression domestically. So there is this connection between the revisionism, the aggression abroad, and greater repression at home. And you're right that there's critical networks of civil society, some of whom have fled, frankly, and DRL has been very active in supporting some of these networks of human rights defenders. So I just underscore and congratulate the Bureau on its work thus far and commit, if confirmed, to continuing this work to help human rights defenders from that area of the world, including in Belarus, frankly. Um, civil society is critical. It's critical to the future of Ukraine. It's critical to the future of democratic order and institutions across uh, Europe and Eastern Europe. And I'm watching these other states that are where Russia's trying to um, infiltrate, frankly, and trying to push away and diminish democratic institutions in countries like Moldova, et cetera. So if confirmed, this will be a high priority. It's not just in Russia itself, where the situation is terrible and getting worse, but also in, its, in the region where Russia is having an outside hand and is using its aggression in Ukraine um, to stir up, uh, to, to really diminish uh, democratic freedoms. I, you're, you're absolutely right in Ukraine. President Zelensky is really trying hard to develop democratic institutions. He's really fighting a system that had significant corruption in it, and he is now trying to prevent the growth of oligarchs that could compromise the democratic institutions in a free Ukraine. We need to be laser focused on helping him deal with the challenges he is confronting. We have a president who really wants to make progress, but it's a challenge and he needs the help of the United States. So I'm glad to see that you're focused on that issue. Senator Shaheen. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. One of the things that would help a lot is passing the supplemental <laughs> funding bill so that Ukraine could keep their government operations open and continue to fight the war against Russia. So um, let's don't forget that. Um, I think this is a question for Dr. Rand, but also maybe for Mr. Lang, because last month the World Economic Forum released a report that cited misinformation and disinformation as the most concerning global risk of the next two years. And I would argue that it's one of the greatest threats to democracy, both at home and abroad. So obviously the State Department has a global engagement center that is intended to lead our response to address disinformation campaigns, but I think there has been some challenges in um, getting the global engagement center uh, to do the kind of coordination and cooperation that needs to happen in order to be effective. So can you talk about how you would implement countering disinformation and democracy programming in coordination with the Global Engagement Center? And then I'll ask you, Mr. Lang, also if you would respond to that. Sure. Well, first of all, um, thank you very much, uh, Senator. And I would just want to say off the bat that as Assistant Secretary, if confirmed, I will work with these colleagues, but also across the State Department. This is a cross-State Department effort, including with the new Bureau of CDP and the regional bureaus and the Global Engagement um, Center and GPA, et cetera. Um, you've identified a critical issue, and DRL's foreign assistance programs are trying um, to make a dent in this problem, including by working on internet freedom. DRL has a very advanced and specific set of programs that are trying trying to promote independent voices when there's censorship afoot. Um, we are finding around the world that blocking internet is a tool of the autocrats, and then you know, flooding the zone with mis- and disinformation, as you rightly put, as a way to shore up authoritarians and those who want to threaten the freedom. So it's that combination of censorship and then misinformation, which is very dangerous, and we're seeing it even this month, frankly. There have been instances where we've seen new instances of it. Um, so if confirmed, I'm going to take a look at all the foreign assistance programs we have. I, I suspect that we can do more with CDP and with others to update them and to integrate them. There's also the interagency that has good ideas. Uh, and I also want to talk to experts. You know, the White House just issued its EO on AI and that artificial intelligence and new technologies are making this much more complicated. So I would like to work with all of those technical experts to see what we can do on our foreign assistance programs. Thank you, Mr. Lang. 
Uh, thank you, Senator Shaheen, and I, I agree that this is a, a critical issue and one that the United States government and the State Department needs to fully engage on. Uh, the Cyberspace and Digital Policy Bureau has a coordinator for digital freedom who leads our efforts on misinformation and disinformation. Uh, so I'm, I'm not a part of that team, but I know that they have prioritized this, especially working through the OECD's Misinformation and Disinformation Hub, of which the United States is a, a co-chair of the, the steering group. Uh, so that has been one of the, the the key channels that we have tried to advance our interests on, on this critical issue. Um, I appreciate that, and I know there's a lot of good work going on. I would argue that one of the challenges we have is that nobody's in charge. There's a lot of effort, but no one person who is responsible, and that that hinders our ability to um, move forward in a coordinated way. Let me stay with you, Mr. Lang, for a very parochial issue that um, deals with some of the technical aspects of your position. Um, one of the challenges that we've had in northern New Hampshire that I think is shared by some of our neighbors along the Canadian border is that um, we have challenges between our small rural communities and communicating um, particularly for law enforcement and safety issues because of the licensing process that requires approval by both the FCC and Canada's ISED um, to change where towers go and where radio communications can happen. Um, let me give a lot of credit to Ambassador Cohen, who's been very helpful with our office in trying to address these issues. But if confirmed, would you be willing to help assist us in working on this problem? Because it's a very real challenge for some of those very small communities. Uh, thank you, Senator Shaheen. Um, I, the FCC has the lead in managing those issues, but of course my team works uh, hand in hand with the FCC all the time uh, in their engagements with, with international partners, and we would be more than happy to help facilitate those efforts uh, to resolve those issues. Thank you. And Dr. Rand, you mentioned Belarus um, in your opening statement, or maybe it was in your response to Senator Cardin. But how specifically would you work with USAID and with Voice of America to support independent media and human rights defenders in Belarus who have really done an amazing job in, under very difficult circumstances with Lukashenko as in charge? Right, Senator, and Lukashenko's deepening sort of techniques right. and tactics, which are, again, utilizing new technologies. So you have to keep up with the innovation of some of these autocrats. Yes, this is a whole government effort in Belarus, and USAID is doing tremendous work as well. DRL has one piece of this puzzle, which is to help some of the human rights defenders, especially when they're out of the country and trying to continue to build civil society networks outside the country. Of course, there's also important um, work that other agencies are doing. There's also DRL has a role in the diplomacy here, right? Raising these is issues in Belarus at the multilateral forum, making sure other governments in Europe that have a lot on their plate, frankly, when it comes to democratic erosions and backsliding in their region also raise the issues in Belarus. So I see DRL as both a programmatic office, but really, frankly, a diplomatic office that needs to continue pressuring the diplomats around me to ensure that these issues are raised everywhere they go. Well, thank you, and congratulations to all of you. And Ms. Welton, I, I'm out of time, but I very much appreciate the importance of your role in the Indo-Pacific um, as we're looking at countering China. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Van Hollen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, it's great to see all of you. Congratulations on your, your nominations. Um, Dr. Rand, it was good to talk to you a little bit uh, just yesterday. And I, I just wanted to follow up on a couple of the things we talked about, starting with the Leahy Laws, uh, named after our, our former colleague, Senator uh, Patrick uh, Leahy, uh, which, as you know, bars military assistance to units of foreign security forces if the Secretary of State has credible information that the unit uh, has committed a gross violation of human rights. Now, this law has been on the books for a very long uh, time now, uh, but it's been, I think, challenging for the State Department uh, to implement, or let me put it differently, the, the State Department, in my view, has never had sort of the political will to really implement this. Can you speak a little bit to um, what you would do to make sure uh, that we 
we, we make sure that countries comply and that and the United States implements the Leahy laws. Thank you, Senator, and I enjoyed our conversation as well um, in your office. Uh, the Leahy law is a critical law that's been on the books, and if confirmed, first and foremost, I will apply it consistently, fairly, around the world. All U.S. security assistance recipients are subject to the Leahy law. Um, and I will make sure, first, operationally, that DRL has the resources, the bandwidth, the capital that it needs to continue working on this law, including the vetting that goes on to take in the allegations of credible information and then to deemed in a fair and consistent manner which units are ineligible per the first part of the law. So that's DRL's job. And if confirmed, that's going to require my management and my leadership to make sure. I have a fairly good sense that they're doing a great job now. But if confirmed, I will go in and see what else I can do to make sure that it's implemented. That's the first part of the law. And I also want to underscore that there's a second part of the law that Senator Leahy really used to emphasize publicly when he talked about the law and how proud he was of the law. And that was the duty to inform the host government that a unit has been deemed ineligible, right? If we just ding at them and take away the security assistance without informing and conveying this accountability measure, then we're only doing half of our work. So if confirmed, I want to work on the diplomatic part, the duty to inform, making sure that our embassies and our posts understand that this is part of their legal obligations and that they need to work with host governments, ministries of defense and others to convey that there are individuals and units and leaders that have committed these um, GVHR, gross violations of human rights, and that they must be held accountable. That is in the law itself, that there is a requirement for military accountability or when it's police, judicial require, uh, civilian accountability. So that second part, I will commit to you that I will work with my colleagues in the diplomatic corps and if necessary, go embassy to embassy um, where there's a great deal of security assistance being given to make sure that that's being implemented. Apologize. So uh, on that, on, on the, the first point actually, it, the first phase of that, which is identifying countries where there's credible evidence of violations of the Leahy Law, I believe that triggers in itself a responsibility to notify the Congress, even at that stage. Is that correct? That has been the custom, so yes. And I, if confirmed, I will continue that because I see no reason not to. Right. Well, if if that is if that is the case, then at least to my knowledge, um, the Leahy law is not even be triggered um, in in many circumstances, uh, at least based on notification I've seen, which does raise certain questions. I mean, you don't even get to the second part if you don't have the original uh, determinations of credibility, credibility violations. Um, let me just ask you a, a broader question because, as you know, President Biden uh, has said we have a, a values-based foreign policy. I mean, no country is obviously perfect, uh, but that uh, we want to make sure that we fight to uphold democracy and, and human rights around the world. And our adversaries often uh, point to some of our inconsistencies in applying that standard uh, both to friends as well as to foes. Would you agree that failure to apply that, that, that measure consistently um, undermines the credibility of our foreign policy when that happens? Yes, thank you. And step back, this is one of the reasons I'm excited to return to this bureau where I was the Deputy Assistant Secretary. I believe that DRL is a fundamentally and critical part of our foreign policy. Yes, it's just a bureau in the State Department, but it really speaks to the values of human dignity, uh, a freedom of, of universal rights that are core to our country, that are in our Constitution, and that have been expressed for, for decades, if not centuries, in our foreign policy. We need to be consistent. We need to be clear. There are times when we're going to have to prioritize other issues um, over human rights. I will try to make sure those times are few and far between. Um, and I fundamentally believe, in terms of my vision for this bureau, that we can integrate human rights and values into our geopolitical and strategic interests. They don't need to balance these. They're not always at odds. There's a careful and creative diplomatic way to integrate them that overall improves our power, our standing, our influence, and our leverage that befits a global superpower. Thank you, I appreciate that. Because if, if we don't do that, again, our adversaries will claim we're only using this as a political cudgel when it's convenient against our adversaries and not applying standard uh, to our friends as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome to all three of our witnesses. Thank you very much for your continued willingness to serve the United States of America. Um, uh, Dr. Rand, I'm very glad that you're taking up this post. It's one of the most important um, uh, in the department. I, I frankly just want to build on Senator Van Hollen's questions because I really do, I really do worry um, about the impression that is created around the world about our sincerity when it comes to human rights, when um, you know, we continue to let some of our most important strategic and security allies get away with some just absolutely miserable human rights records. And I want to draw your attention to Egypt um, because um, this committee um, you know, has been in a pretty regular fight, dispute, argument with the administration over the question of aid release to a country that doesn't lock up dozens of political prisoners, doesn't lock up hundreds of political prisoners. Egypt literally has tens of thousands of people in prison today for political crimes. Uh, and yet, it was Chairman Cardin, not the administration, who had to hold $235 million in FY22 military aid just so that the law was followed. The law says Egypt can't get this money unless they make progress on certain human rights issues, including significantly improving pretrial detention practices, accelerating the pardon and release of those political prisoners, and more generally providing space for human rights defenders. The reason we always get from the administration on why we have to waive these human rights conditions with Egypt is that they won't cooperate or help us without the human rights conditions being waived. I think that fundamentally misunderstands the fact that many of the things that Egypt used to do 30 years ago just to please us, they now do today because they have independent strategic reasons. For instance, to be in a security cooperative relationship with Israel. So, I, I want to ask you if you would commit to this committee that you will not advocate for releasing that $235 million until those conditions are met. Progress on pretrial detention, the acceleration of pardon and release of political prisoners, which include thousands of people imprisoned for speech and association, and the expansion of space for human rights defenders, civil society advocates, and political opposition. Senator, first of all, thank you for your service and your record on these issues and human rights in the Senate. Um, we've worked together on other countries and it's, you've been an incredible champion as has the chair. On Egypt, you have my word that if confirmed as Assistant Secretary for DRL, I will be the voice at the table that takes US law, and in this case, the very clear language in the report on the foreign operations bill about conditionality to Egypt that has been very clear now for the past three or four years and make sure and advocates within the State Department and within the interagency to ensure that we do not, that we adhere to the law essentially and we, um, we comply with these requirements regarding human rights. I can't promise that I always win these interagency debates, um, but I can promise you that if confirmed, I will be the voice at the table making a clear, analytical, thoughtful, well-informed argument and trying to figure out how diplomatically we can change the situation on the ground because that ultimately is what's so worrisome is that with all these years since we've had these levers of accountability, the situation has gotten a little bit better here, a little bit worse this year, but fundamentally has not improved at all. And as you say, this is a country where we have a very complex, important strategic relationship. We have many issues that we're working on with Egypt. It's a very big country, a huge population, a young population. It's critical that we remain present and there. And the human rights situation is unacceptable. Yeah, I, um, I don't disagree. I, I just think, by and large, in the Middle East, our policy sometimes gets stuck in, like, 1989 and we say the same things over and over and over again, and we assume that actors behave the same way they did 30 years ago, we give the same amount of money to Egypt that we did when we started our direct military financing relationship with them, despite how things have so fundamentally changed. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm gonna uh, submit 
a question for the record on Tunisia. Um, I would just note that last year's budget request cited Tunisia as a possible recipient of additional military aid, quote, if Tunisia shows signs of a return to democratic governance. This is another country where we have an opportunity to use our aid as a clear signal about our frustration, displeasure, and worry about the quick slide away from democracy. We also have a opportunity to support civil society at a real moment of peril in Tunisia. Uh, we can withhold aid uh, as a sign that we are serious about uh, pushing human rights and democracy, but we can also flow aid to non-government actors in places like Tunisia um, who are still carrying on the fight. So um, this is a, another country that I know the chairman cares about as well, and I'll submit uh, a question or two for the record on Tunisia as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Murphy, let me um, just underscore the point that you raised in regards to Egypt and in regards to the role that we expect DRL to play in advocating for the enforcement of our laws and the value-based foreign policy that we believe is the strength of America. And, and underscore the point that Senator Van Hollen also made. If we are not informed, we can't assist in carrying out our policies. So we recognize that the battle within the State Department has many different objectives. And historically, our values have not always been at the highest priorities in the conversations that take place with our strategic partners. We recognize that. But we expect you to advocate for our values and to win those battles in the State Department. But we also expect you to keep us informed. We have a responsibility. The first questions I asked you, were, and you have already have said yes to all the questions we asked, is to keep us informed so that we can also engage those battles. But if we don't know what's going on, it's tough for us to do that. So uh, Senator Mur Murphy is absolutely right. We, we'll take unilateral action at times, but it's better if we're informed before we do that. So I'm just going to encourage you to respond to our requests as it relates to how well you are succeeding in your battles at the State Department. I will be up here frequently. I will engage with your staff. Um, you will be hearing from me. I'm a former set, a Senate staffer, so I really understand how useful, frankly, the senators can be, the staff can be in this part of our foreign policy. So, so let me go to Timor Lashley for a moment, <laughs> Ms. Walton. Um, there's a lot of good things happening there. there the path to ASEAN looks positive. looks like that's moving forward. They are, are, have a free society, which is also unusual in that part of the world. But as you pointed out, there are some concerns, some concerns on their relationship with PRC. We want countries to have good relationships with all countries. But if it is against our foreign policy, and what we're trying to achieve, for example, the China Sea is being open to free to commerce, then it's a concern to us. And the stronger that the PRC has relationships with other countries, it can make it challenging for us to implement the policies that we think are best in that region. So I do want you to tell us a little bit more how you're going to deal with that trend of, uh, of relationship to PRC. And also, it's a young country as far as the development of their civil societies. How do you encourage the strengthening of civil societies and the protection and growth of human rights respect for all of its citizens? Well, I definitely appreciate your question, and I share your concern, Senator, um, Mr. Chairman, uh, about the uh, about the negative influence and the attempts at coercion that we are seeing more and more um, from the People's Republic of China um, around the world, not just, of course, in, in Timor-Leste. Um, I think if confirmed, I'm going, I would focus on, on the general areas uh, that are outlined in the Indo-Pacific strategy, but on a retail level, right, on, on, in Timor-Leste, and that is to support and continue 
the programs that USAID, DRL, um, and others in the interagency do to support um, governance institutions, uh, fight the tendency towards corruption, and make um, the operations of the government as clear and transparent um, and as as supportive of the aspirations of the Timor-Leste people as possible. I will, um, if confirmed, be that engager um, for, for there. The other um, aspect that we are focused on uh, there, as I understand, is to strengthen the economy, to diversify the economy so that they have many opportunities uh, to grow and, and support livelihood and, sta and, and living status in, in Timor-Leste. Um, and that includes improving education, which we're doing through the Millennium Challenge Compact um, and through USAID programs, uh, focus on civil society uh, through um, programs that are focused on women as well as, as the media. Um, and a whole host of things I will spend a lot of time uh, encouraging uh, Dr. Rands, if she's confirmed, her, um, her folks to help us do that. Um, it's increasingly important, as, as I've heard today, um, and I'm, I definitely agree, uh, that our values be front and center of everything that we do, even in a small um, place like Timor-Leste. Uh, their voice, when added to ASEAN, will also add tremendously to regional stability and economic growth uh, for them and for the, the Indo-Pacific. Thank you. Well, thank you for that answer. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, the confirmation process we take very seriously here. We listen to what you're saying, and we expect that you'll keep us informed on progress. We'll send you some friendly reminders at times as to what things are going on. Our staff is pretty good at following up with letters to you all, but you can beat them to the punch by just informing us as to what you're doing. We, we appreciate that. It's lonely at times. We like letters and communication, so <laughs> don't, don't hesitate to keep us informed. I have to say that over you know the many years of, of my career as a Foreign Service officer, I have always enjoyed having your staff visit our posts and our missions overseas. They bring um, a lot of energy, a lot of knowledge, and they, they really do help us in our work. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. We appreciate that, that those thoughts. We also know that you look forward when their plane takes off and leaves the country as well. So <laughs> we, we know, we know how this all goes. Anyway, uh, Mr. Mr. Lang, uh, last year was the first full fiscal year for the International Technology Security and Innovation Fund. Uh, and it was used uh, to help deal with some of the cabling. Uh, this will be the second year. Can you just give us an indication of where you think the priorities should be on the utilization of these funds? Uh, yes, Senator Cardin. First of all, I'd like to express appreciation for the Congress's support for ITSI funding. Um, it's a very valuable tool for us in our efforts to promote trusted supply uh, in ICT infrastructure. I, I think undersea cables is an important area where we will uh, endeavor to use those funds. Um, we recently, this the Bureau of Cyberspace and Digital Policy recently announced that we would be able to use uh, $15 million over the next three years to support connections in the Pacific, working together with industry and Australia as well to uh, help facilitate connections that wouldn't otherwise be uh, made with um, by, by private companies. And I think that's a good example of the kind of work that we'd like to expand to help build out trusted infrastructure for, for countries uh, that are, are looking to make the difficult choice between trusted and untrusted suppliers. Thank you. Dr. Rand, uh, I'm, I'm glad that Senator Murphy raised uh, Egypt. I would have raised it if he did not, but I want to raise India as well. Uh, we know about the plot to assassinate a sheik on U.S. soil and Canadian soil. Uh, you would like to hear your commitment to how you would get engaged in those types of efforts to make sure that type of conduct does not take place. Yes, it is very concerning what happened on U.S. soil and on Canadian soil. And first and foremost, it's clear that India is a critical ally partner. We're the oldest democracy. They're the biggest democracy. But it's those shared values, our democratic values, that we need that bind this alliance. And as, if confirmed, as 
DRL Assistant Secretary, I will be a voice in the administration making sure that we're not abashed, we're not afraid to talk about our concerns about human rights, democracy, and of course these troubling trends towards what we're seeing. The, um, you know, Again, I'm not in the administration, so I don't know all the details of what happened, and I understand DOJ and FBI are working on it, but I think it's really critical that even as we strengthen our relationship with India as part of our Indo-Pacific strategy, we make human rights and democracy the center of that relationship and we, we talk truth in this relationship and we speak frankly about our concerns. Um, and so I'm not shy and I will be a voice uh, at the State Department and in the administration making that clear. Uh, I appreciate that and I can mention many other countries that we have that are allies or strategic partners. We like to have a strategic relationship with just about every country in the world if we can. Some it's impossible, but we do need to work with the global community. But as President Biden said, it needs to be embraced in our values. And you're the principal enforcer to make sure that message is, is understood by those that are engaged in U.S. foreign policy. So we'll, we'll hold you to that. Uh, the uh, record will remain open until uh, the close of business tomorrow. Uh, I would encourage you, as Senator Murphy already indicated, gave you a preview on one of the questions, that if you could get those questions uh, answered as promptly as possible and as completely as possible so that we can clear uh, the formal process and be able to act on your nominations in a timely way. And with that, again, with your thanks to you, to, for your public service and to your family, uh, the hearing will stand adjourned. Thank you.